Good. Uh, very good. So, so we have uh, Adil Najam uh, uh, up on the screen. And uh, what we have uh, so far this morning is sort of a, a very nice tour of the landscape from uh, Professor Pramachalani. A very um, nice tour of the landscape from uh, Professor Pramachalani. A very nice okay. tour of the landscape from... We, we might need you to mute your uh, computer for a second, Adil. If you would. For a second, Adil. Okay, I'm going to skip the whole introductory part and okay. just hand it straight over to uh, Adil Najam, uh, who's going to try and take us into a discussion of how we move forward. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, can someone give me an indication maybe on the message? I have turned my live stream off. Um, can people hear me there? Very good. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It is a great pleasure uh, to be with you. And uh, this is an organization that I have uh, the highest and utmost respect for. And I think the topic that you have chosen for today and, and talking about in the South Asian context is about as timely um, as it possibly can be. I uh, really do wish that I was there uh, myself with you to be uh, there live with you and unfortunately um, that was not possible but uh, luckily um, while we still live in a world of borders uh, technology is one of the things that helps us break those borders so very much in the theme I am very glad that technology has come to our assistance. I want to use my few minutes to essentially make three points. Uh, I'm usually a, a PowerPoint or a slide person, but uh, luckily, I, uh, by not being there, I'm, I'm, I will resist the temptation to put those. And I'll make three big points. People before me, both the speakers, have made excellent points on both the larger end and the practical end of doing something about climate change. But I want to make three points which I think are central, central to the future of South Asia as it relates to climate change, and they are central to the work of MSF. They are central to the type of work that Doctors Without Borders does, and really central to the type of work that I think many people in this room uh, do. So there are three points. The first of the points that I want to make is a very clear sense has to really emerge that we are now, as of today, as of May 27th, and before that, now living in the age of adaptation. Now, this may seem a trivial matter, but it's not because, frankly, I think the culprit here are people who work on climate change. And many of us, unfortunately, are still talking about as if the age of adaptation is something in the future. No, it is not. The age of adaptation is here. It is here today, it is happening now. What does that mean? What that means is that we have generally in the past talked about climate change as if it was something that would happen in the future. Because we were living in the age of mitigation. And you all know the difference between mitigation and adaptation, but the central premise of the old age was that if we are wise enough, if we do something about climate change, we will somehow be able to avoid climate change or minimize climate change. That is no longer true. Because of the callousness of our species, because of the consumptive sins, not just of the rich countries, but of rich people, you and me, in developing countries, we are now living in a place where we have condemned not just future but current generations to live in the age of adaptation, which means that we will have to adapt to climate change. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that mitigation has evaporated. That doesn't mean mitigation is no longer important. Mitigation is very important, uh, but simply because if we don't mitigate, the amount of adaptation needed will be even more. So yes, mitigation is important to reduce future impact, but now we are condemned 
to live with impact. Now, this has very serious, serious implications that I will come to, but let me give you a very, very simple, uh, simple example with two facts before I go to my second point. And the first of this is that Mr. Donald Trump aside and, and, and other skeptics aside, this myth and this lie that we need to do more science for climate change because we need to know more about it before we act is absolute nonsense. Yes, we need to do more science to figure out how to do it better. Yes, we need to do more science how to find better solutions. Yes, we need to do more science to f because more science is always good. But no, we do not need to do more science simply to find out whether this is real or not. Here is my artifact, which I would have put up on the screen if I had uh, the ability, but let me give you the numbers. Between 1991 and 2012, Note these numbers carefully. 1991 to 2012, 13,950, 13,950 scholarly papers were written in peer-reviewed journals on climate change. 13,950. And of those 13,950 papers, only 24 in any way rejected the idea of climate change. Please tell me what other scientific concept has greater scientific um, uh, unanimity than 13,950 papers, only 24 of which question the idea in any matter. So let us put that whole nonsense aside. The second important point is that tells us that we are living in the age of climate impact, we are living in the age of adaptation is that if any one of you in this room is 32 years of younger, I can't see you, but I would still like you to raise your hands if you are 32 years or younger. If you are 32 years or younger, you have never in your life, never in your entire life, you have never ever witnessed a year that was cooler than average. And my instinct tells me you're not going to do that in a fairly long time. That is the extent of the reality of climate change. So this is not something in the future. This is something that is probably already impacting your work, whether you recognize it or not. Certainly it is impacting the world work of Doctors Without Borders. So that is point one. Point two is in the age of adaptation, the, in the age of climate impacts, the key metric of how we talk about climate change changes. In the old age of mitigation, which hasn't ended, that's still continuing, as I said, but now we are in this, in this new formulation of adaptation being added to it. As long as we were talking only about mitigation, the way to talk about climate change was essentially to talk about carbon. Because mitigation was really about carbon management. That is all it was about, how to manage uh, carbon so that we can, uh, we, can, we can reduce future impacts. And that is all that was to it. As long as we were talking carbon, we were really only talking energy because that was the primary culprit. Therefore, the entire focus of the climate debate was on carbon management. Therefore, the entire focus of the climate debate was on energy management. That is why you hear about Teslas and you hear about cars and you hear about renewable energy and you hear about oil prices. All of that is important. However, however, the real focus of climate change in the age of adaptation has moved in the periodic table. It has moved from carbon to hydrogen and oxygen. And what I mean by that is that we are now living in a place and a time where we are and will be defining climate change mostly, mostly through the lens of water. Climate is no longer only carbon defined. Climate is going to be more and more defined by issues of water. And that is where I think it will hit your real lives as individuals and as professionals in the humanitarian and development fields. What do I mean? Think about, think for a moment about the major impacts of climate change, particularly in South Asia, whether it is Pakistan, whether it is India, whether it is Nepal, whether it is Bhutan, whether it is Bangladesh, whether it is Sri Lanka, but anywhere in the world, whether it is Africa. Think about war-torn areas 
and think about where does climate change actually impact the lives of people. And I bet you that most of the answer you will find will no longer be about carbon, they will be about water. Think about this. So what is climate impact? What are the most likely climate impacts? They are about water uh, melting glaciers. They are about water disappearing drought. They are about water rising, sea level rise. They are about water falling from the sky like no one's business, extreme events. So climate where it meets real people and real impacts really turns into issues of water. And that I think is where in your practice world, climate starts impacting how we live, what we do, uh, how we do it. My country, Pakistan, for example, has now been for nearly eight years in a constant state of floods and a constant state of drought and a constant state of heat waves. Now, no one is suggesting this is simply because of climate change. That's not how the fingerprint on the trigger works. What climate does is it exacerbates regular processes, but then creates a new normal. And I believe all across South, South Asia, there is a new normal that is water defined, that is sometimes water scarcity defined, that is very often water intensity defined, but that is everywhere exacerbated by the forces of climate, uh, climate change and is everywhere showing itself in the lives of real people in the form of water. So that is the thing to take care of. Finally, and I hope I'm not, not, not overstepping my time here, finally my last point. And this is, 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 is a sad point, but it is a real point. It is a point that MSF knows very well. The poor shall pay. The poor always do. That's unfair, but that's the world we live in. That's the world we need to change, but I don't think we're going to change it very soon. So let's at least realize the reality that here is an issue that is exacerbated by the, the equity issue is very, very important. It is exacerbated not just by rich country, poor country, but by rich people, poor people. By this, by this great differential, not just in consumption, but in the footprint that you and I leave on planet Earth, which is far more dangerous and which has real impact on the lives of the poorest people who do not leave that footprint uh, and, and, and whose life is going to be impacted. Here is, here is what I mean by it. Climate eventually is a development issue. And this is the real big problem with, I think, climate, how it is discussed, at least where I am right now uh, in, 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 in developed countries. Climate is still seen only as an environmental issue, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a planet and cute and cuddly issue. And we need to humanize the impacts of climate change, what it means to ordinary people, not just to polar bears. I've got nothing against polar bears. I love them. But we have to humanize the real pain and the real misery and most importantly, the real insecurity that climate change causes. We have to talk about climate change in the language of insecurity. We have to talk about climate change in the language of vulnerability. We have to talk about climate change in the language of poverty. And we really have to talk about climate change as an issue of justice of development justice around the world. Let me give you one, one example as I end, and I was, I was warned that I should be very neutral in what I say, not bring politics. So let me say I am not trying to bring politics. I, I'm a professor of international affairs, and, and that's my lens, but, but this is really not a political issue, so bear with me for just a minute. Some years ago, I wrote a book along with colleagues, edited a book called uh, Human Security, Environment and Development in South Asia. Uh, this was about all of South Asia. We had about eight authors from all the countries in South Asia. And uh, in one of my favorite, favorite numbers, harrowing numbers that comes out of it um, is, 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 is the following. Um, and, and it is about water. Uh, and and it, is, it is the following. At that point, it was 60 years of constant conflict between India and Pakistan. Again, I'm not making a political point here. 60 years of constant conflict 
between India and Pakistan. Not one war, two war, three wars, just up and down various levels of conflict. In the 60 years of conflict between India and Pakistan, total number of Indians, total number of Indians killed by the Pakistan side in 60 years is less than, listen carefully, total number of Indians killed by the Pakistan side in 60 years is less than the number of children only who will die in New Delhi only where you sit today in one year only because of dirty water only. The exact same number is true on the Pakistan side for Karachi. That I think is the reality of what climate change is about when it meets impact, when it's to meet water. I'm not suggesting those people died, those children died because of climate change, but I'm what I'm suggesting is that climate change exacerbates development and human insecurity issues like the one that I'm talking about. Why does this make me, uh, why does this make my blood boil at 4 a.m. where I am now? Why am I getting excited at 4 a.m. in the morning talking to you about this? Here is why. If you are the mother of one of those children who die, whether they die in New Delhi or whether they die in Karachi because of dirty water, you do not care whether your child dies at the wrong end of a gun or a wrong end of a tap. Your child is no less dead in one case than the other. And yet we as scholars, we as journalists, we as policymakers talk about one death as if it is a national calamity and the other death as if it is a development statistic. Please go and explain that to the mother of that child. Here is why I get excited about it. As a policy practitioner, as a policy scholar, as, 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 as a professor, here is what I know. I have taught international affairs now for more than a quarter of a century. I have no idea what I can do about that gun. I know exactly what I can do about that tap. $8.80 is the cost of saving one life because of dirty water. And the cost is just about the same whether it is in New Delhi or in Karachi. And that, I think, is the real tragedy of climate change. That until we bring it from just being about carbon management, until we turn it from something about carbon management to something about human security, to human well-being, to development justice, we shall not be doing justice to the issue of climate change. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor uh, Najam. I hope you can hear us. Maybe you can just nod if you can hear us. Um, can you hear us? Yes? You can, can, okay. Can you nod if you can? Yes. Okay. Please nod if you can hear us. Okay. Nod if you can. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Please nod if you can hear us. Okay. Yes. All right. So we right. will um, now um, move into question and answers. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard me earlier, but thank you very, very much for that extremely uh, erudite but also quite moving, uh, moving talk uh, and motivating talk. So can we now, can I invite Jyotsna back up on the panel uh, and uh, let's take a few questions, a few comments, um, if people would like to react to either of these talks or, or indeed to anything Professor Chelani said, the floor is open. Yes, please, first and second back then. Um, so I come from the health movement, so I have a very simple question to ask you. Do you think the health movement takes climate change very seriously? Okay, we'll gather a few questions because the back and forth with the time lag -like becomes, becomes hard. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I think there have been studies about how climate change has exacerbated the war in Syria or Yemen or places like this. And um, are we going to see more of this in the future? And since we're talking about Asia, maybe uh, some ideas about how what's happening with the climate will have, can affect Asia from that point of view. Okay, so the effects of climate change on 
in a sense, traditional uh, military security kinds of issues and internal unrest uh, issues. I'd like to take a couple more because there's, over, there's a time lag before we go back to our, uh, if, in particular if we go back to Professor Najam. Who am I missing? Oh, please. There's a microphone coming to you. Yeah, this question for uh, Professor Najam. How would you place uh, food security in the realm of um, climate change vis a vis water? Food security in the realm of climate change vis a vis water. One over here, please. So, um, I'm Ankur. Uh, my question is, I get that we understand what climate change does to us as human beings. Uh, uh, so uh, I get that we know enough what it does to us. Do we know enough what to do to mitigate or adapt? Well, uh, I get that we know enough. Okay. And I think that's probably enough for a first round of questions. Let me, let me also just pose one uh, to, to Jyotsna Puri, uh, which is to say that uh, you gave us very convincing evidence of the need for more careful uh, and clear evaluation studies, understanding better what the, um, uh, uh, how much we actually do know about how effective our interventions are. But in a sense, it's a similar question to uh, the one for Professor Chalani. Is that the constraint on action? Or do we already know enough to act reasonably well in at least a subset of cases? So maybe uh, we'll just do this in reverse order. Turn to Professor Najam first, and then come back to you, if that's okay, Joe. So over to you, uh, 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 Adil. If you could just text him as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I did hear the questions. I've just muted it, so I hope you can hear me. If I can just get a signal that you can. Um, I, will, uh, I will not try to answer all the questions. Uh, they are extremely, um, extremely good, very good questions. They're excellent questions. And, and you realize that when someone says they're excellent questions, uh, what they really mean is that, um, that, that I have no idea how to answer them. <laughs> Uh, that's why they are good questions. Uh, but here is here is a few thoughts. Uh, first, on this this excellent question that was pa posed, does health take climate change seriously? I will I will leave that to you. Uh, you are the health professionals. But let me honestly say to you what I do know. Uh, I do not think that the climate change people take health seriously. Uh, I, I I really don't. And and this is my sort of. <laughs> this is my 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 jihad, if you will, uh, in in climate change circles itself, trying to get climate change people to take development seriously because I think we have carbonized the issue too much, as I pointed out. Uh, this is going to be a major issue. One of the things I didn't talk about, uh, but the neglect is major because I think amongst the biggest things that will hit the climate community is uh, vector uh, disease vectors. And we are seeing this with epidemics, whether it is dengue and so on and so forth. Again, I'm not suggesting the link between climate and these is direct, but I think the scientific evidence is that that is probably one of the biggest things that will hit beyond natural disaster that will make those dots connect. And I don't think the climate community is ready for it. That's my thought. The second point is about wars, and you are exactly right. There's been excellent research certainly in Rwanda, less so in Syria, uh, which suggests that particularly in Africa, some of the recent conflicts that we have seen have had climatic causality. That doesn't mean the causality is linear. What that means is that in many of these situations, there is a natural resource push that comes before the conflict. And what you start seeing is that, you know, um, water disappears in my area, I start moving into your territory, you are nice to me and you say, sure, come and take, take, take a drink. And then I just stay there and very soon you find that you and I have ages, centuries of dispute. And so climate becomes a major exacerbating factor in conflict. And we have seen this in Africa, within our region, I think we have seen it more around the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. We all talk about extremism and we all talk about the religious aspect, but there's a natural resource aspect. And you can look at, at 
the spatial maps of what has happened to vegetation in these nomadic tribes uh, of nomadic people with very little vegetation in the first place when you have large movements of people of refugees that puts a pressure on natural resources and that natural resource pressure then translates into uh, into into conflict. A final thought on that about food security um, and, and water wars. Water wars wasn't mentioned, but when we talk certainly India, Pakistan, that's that's one of the thoughts that comes. First on food security, you're exactly right. Food once you talk water, you're really talking food. Particularly in South Asia. You know, in, in some ways I, I think of what is food except nature's way of packaging water. <laughs> Right? Water is the most important ingredient in what we call food in our region. Nature just takes water, packages it as wheat sometimes and as, as fruit other times and so on and so forth so that we can transport it. But water and food are very, very critically related. My own research in Pakistan suggests both the good and the bad news. The bad news is that we did a study of climate impact on, um, on wheat and rice in southern Punjab and upper Sindh in Pakistan. And what we found was that with current climatic trends, the productivity could go down by up to 15 percent, one five. That is huge for a country whose, whose economics is really dependent on, on these crops. However, on the other side, we found that even with the very little good adaptation program, uh, uh, inputs, that yield could come up. Not just, not just, not just stay there, but come up by up to 12 percent from what it is now. So there is a benefit, just like there is a benefit in the energy transition. There could be a benefit in better agricultural and food practices because of adaptation. Water wars, and last point on this, and sorry for taking time. The same book that I had mentioned. Uh, in that book, we had a final chapter which we all co-wrote and we had five conclusions about South Asia and human security. Only one of them was unanimous. These are South Asians. We never agree. We are argumentative. So of the five, only one was unanimous. You wouldn't guess what that is, but let me tell you. The unanimous conclusion was India and Pakistan will not go to war over what? Why? Because we've got so many other things to fight about first. But also why? Because water is too important. That doesn't mean water does, doesn't become conflict. It becomes conflict very often at local levels. It becomes conflict at the village level in, in both India and Pakistan, wherever water is. So yes, water is a source of conflict, but historically it has not been a source of national war. Uh, my colleague, colleague Aaron Wolf from the University of Colorado suggests that the last real water war was pre-biblical. Uh, but the reason for that is that water is so important to people, so important to people, that they have to find some way to coexist over it. Even in Israel-Palestine, the only agreement that continues to work is the one about groundwater.